And thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk with us, share thank some you. of your knowledge. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So for our viewers who might not be familiar with who you are, do you mm -hmm. mind giving a brief introduction about yourself and your experience with the dog world? Wow, the dog world. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I, well, I, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> no, that's okay. Who are, are your audience mostly pet people or would they be? We've got um, pet people, we've got mm -hmm. confirmation people and dog sport people. Oh, so, so we've got everybody. Audience. Yeah. Okay, so we, I, my family's had bull terriers since 1982 and I, my husband and I breed bull terriers and we've been breeding and showing under the mad cat priest fix since uh, 1997. So we have a ton of titles on our dogs in confirmation uh, and performance. Uh, we, I, I came from the corporate world. I was a semi-professional dog trainer. I wrote a book on dog training, Difficult to Train Breeds, and I just kind of segged into the dog world through that, where it, I just started doing so many seminars that I could no longer keep up. Keep up. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, what we're here to talk about today is puppies and socialization. And so what people now know me most for is my work with our puppy culture program, which yep. is a completely accidental program because we breed dogs, we show dogs, we, we do performance sports with dogs, but it never really occurred to me to make a breeding, a product for breeders and puppy owners so much. Mm -hmm. um, but we were doing a film version of my book, When Pigs Fly, and which is a training, book and so yeah. we had a, a, a film version of that and I happened to have a litter on the ground and I said well you know what let's film just a 20 minute film the developmental periods of puppies mm -hmm. Pat Hastings has a book another piece of the puzzle with a, a front section on the developmental periods in puppies that mm -hmm. every reader has thumbed through until it's yes. all <laughs> good and you know it by heart I said you know 20 minutes just like a visual depiction of what's in there yeah and four years later we had a five-hour film on developmental periods in puppies and the significance of developmental periods and protocols to do during different developmental periods with mm -hmm. because what what i realized is is an incredibly deep topic and a lot of what I was seeing as a professional dog trainer were really just errors or omissions mm -hmm. of the breeder or the puppy owner in that first portion of the puppy's life. Yeah. And so it just took off, you know, like crazy. And it's become our full-time business. My husband and I work, both work, work full-time on it. And, and that's really been our focus. Now, puppy culture itself specifically deals with the critical socialization period, which I know technically is a sensitive socialization period, but we call it critical because it really, if you miss it, yeah, the truth of the matter is it's gone. So, yeah. and, and that is gonna vary from breed to breed, mm -hmm. but probably about the first 12 weeks of life, you're safe if you get your work done in the first 12 weeks of life. Mm -hmm. And so people often ask, is it a breeder product or is it a puppy owner product? And my answer is it's a puppy product. It's about yeah. puppies during this time. And whoever has their hands on those puppies needs this information that's in our 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 program. Yep. And I think that's, you know, been traditionally part of the problem is that there's this sort of disconnect between, well, this is what breeders do and this is what puppy owners do. Mm -hmm. The trajectory is the puppies. The yeah, puppy is following a developmental timeline, so it really doesn't matter to the puppy where he is when he's in a particular developmental period. He needs what he needs. You have right. to serve the puppy the experience that he needs at the time that he needs it, whether you're a puppy owner or a breeder. Right. I, you know, I sort of 
resisted calling it puppy Montessori for a long time, but it really is like a Montessori style learning. It's it's yeah. experiential learning. It's serving the puppy what it what the puppy's asking for. Uh -huh. That all having been said, there definitely is a piece of this, a practical piece of this that the puppy owners need that they that they're not currently getting from puppy culture. And that's what we're working on right now. Awesome. Is I mean, just literally, what do I put on my couch when I bring my puppy home? I mean, how many yeah. how, what what kind of setup do I use? Do I put a litter box? Do I not? Like just the, even animal husbandry. Uh-oh. So I have come on, old dog. No. I have, this is what she, what she wants, a tissue. She's 15 years old. She can do what she wants. All right, I make sure I'm not moving. Okay, I'm okay. Yeah, you're okay. <laughs> it's kind of weird because it looks like I'm looking away from Chelsea, but I am looking at her. <laughs> it's just, looking at her looks like I'm looking away. That's all right. Well, this is what we're working on now. And have, did you have a chance to jump on our class yet? The classroom, the puppy class? Yes, I have. Yeah. So we're trying to give that kind of basic dog wisdom. Yeah, because there's a lot of information out there. And sometimes it's hard for these new puppy people to kind of navigate this world and figure out what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. So that's great oh, that you're working on that. The questions that we get are so, like... I think a lot of times as trainers and breeders, we are giving information, where's my hand? We're yep. giving information up here, you know, yeah. like, well, I mean, you have to do this, this, and this. And then you get a question where you realize that they don't even know what kind of dish to put the food in or, you know, very simple stuff like that. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm looking forward to getting all of that. We're looking forward um, to doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to start um, a little bit with a little bit of information for the breeders, because I think breeders are a little bit panicked right now. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the big things that you go through in puppy culture as early as 14 days is starting to talk about bringing new people or non-family members. Right, into the home. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and then for that six to eight week range, we've got puppy parties that we're doing where we're inviting right. new people into the home. And right. obviously with... COVID-19 and with stay at home and social distancing, those options aren't really available to us. Do you have any ideas for breeders or even puppy people on any sort of substitute for that? Well, I think, I think we have to divide up uh, breeders and puppy people yeah. you know, to some extent. I mean, first of all, I, it's difficult for me to make a concrete suggestion and I'm yeah. going to tell you why, because the laws are subject to interpretation yep. and, and I, I, I want to be very careful not to run afoul of law Absolutely. right and to tell people to do things that would be contrary right um so as far if i had a litter right now you know as far as very early socialization i, I you know like under three to six weeks old i probably you know would still be you know, probably not having people over at all and just um, going through the same protocols that I was do. I always do, but just not new people. Yep. Um, puppy party does, you know, you can have a puppy party without new people. I mean, you can bring out the equipment, you can do the new experiences. They can, you know, you can do it with the people that you have in your household. You can, or at least your immediate family, which I mean, I hope, you know, that there's no, breeders out there are few that are really truly stranded all by themselves that yeah. there's at least one other person that can come and, and be with them yeah you know that all that having been said um you know i think that the risk of transmission if people wash their hands and are you know put disinfectant on their hands and don't you you know cough on or kiss the puppies or whatever yeah you know i think allowing the puppies and now this goes you know straight forward to the puppy owner allowing a, a strange person to pat your puppy mm -hmm. is probably pretty safe yeah and stay far enough away um so take that information and do you know do with it what you will yeah 
uh, you know, the best we can do at this time is do as much with resiliency as possible. So as much as we may not have the opportunities to have people over, maybe we have a little more time to be with our puppy, our litters, and do a few, few more protocols with them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk real quick about those enrichment areas. So when we do these puppy parties, you were mentioning bringing out equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that breeders can do and puppy owners can do is have an X pen or some sort of, you know, monitored controlled enrichment area for them. Do you have recommendations on how people set those areas up in terms of what equipment is fun for them or how often you rotate items in and out of that area? Oh, well, that's a really interesting question because it, you know, to me, it's really different for the breeders and the puppy owners. Okay. So by the time, which one do you want me to address first? Start with the breeders. Okay, so for breeders, um, first of all, my rule is nobody gets hurt. Mm -hmm. So the only tall things that are taller, you know, that they can get on, mm -hmm. like that baby plastic baby slide that everyone uses that they love. I mean, mm -hmm. they all love that. Um, and then I won't put anything unstable or elevated unless it's a solid block you know right for like a yoga block like they they sell these yoga bricks that are uh right they're about that yep. big and this big so they can climb up and down over those the only unstable thing i will put in there is i will put a, a pretty much not over inflated uh balance mat uh because okay. it's yep. and you know even if they roll off it, they, they're probably not gonna hurt themselves. So I wouldn't put a tippy board or anything like that yeah. because toes can get stuck, you know, if one gets on the other one's toes. Right. Can, I'm talking about litters. Right. Um, and so you just, you don't want them to have a bad experience. Right, absolutely. Um, sit and spin is a great thing. You know, that's, that twirls around. Okay. Yep. I keep three bins. Okay. So I rotate things probably about once a week, you know, okay. I'll, I'll change the big equipment out every probably four to seven days, depending on the age of the puppy. And then you're rotating up. Mm -hmm. You really definitely at least once a week want to be switching those toys out because then they become new again. You have to right. again, because literally the six week old puppy and the nine week old puppy, because you're going through three bins. So you've got three weeks are two different animals with right. experiencing things in a completely different way. So that same sit and spin that I put in there at six weeks, when I give it to them at nine weeks, it's a whole new experience. Right. So I had a, a, a video, here's Zulu. Let me see if we can get Zulu here. There she is, 15. Oh. Yeah, Zulu's 15. She's the great, great grandma. She's the matriarch. Yeah, she's getting all the special goods now. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I had put up a, a video of, uh, let me see if I can get this back now. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Hi. <laughs> there you go. Um, I put up a video of uh, Pat, uh, Patsy, that was three litters ago, of Alana, mm -hmm. with her um, Snow saucer. I, that's another thing I'll leave in there is a yeah. plastic snow saucer. Cause, again, because they can't get their toes stuck under it and hurt each other. Right. So I put a picture of her up like last week and we call it the puppy twerk because she's like, oh, you know, <laughs> and she had it when she was six weeks old and yeah. she was just sitting in there, but you give it, to, the old becomes new again, just by right. putting it. So that's what I recommend uh, for breeders. Awesome. Now, what about our puppy owners that puppy might owners, only have one right. dog? You know, for puppy owners, it's a little bit of a different. Um, the weaning pen for breeders is serving really kind of a different purpose than it is for the puppy owners. Okay. So in the breeder's house, I mean, it is literally a holding pen. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're in there. They're experiencing a lot of their life within that pen. The right. vast majority of their life is within with their litter mates in that pen. They're getting outside experiences, but that's really where they live. Right. Once you start um, integrating the puppy into a home, now the pen is taking on a little bit of a different significance. Uh -huh. Now the pen becomes your quiet time, your safe haven. The, the pen now we want to be a cue for relaxation and settle. Uh -huh. 
not that you don't, not that it should be sterile. I usually have one toy. I lots of chew projects and yep. open crate, but I'm going to be crafting my puppy's day so that the time that they're in that pen is downtime. Okay. I mean, sometimes it is just because I can't give the puppy what it needs and I need to continue. Right. But, but the, the, the pen with the open crate is starting to set the foundation for containment and crate training and right. anti-separation anxiety, right? right? So we want that enclosure to start becoming an automatic cue to settle. Yep. And then that easily translates to the crate, you know, because mm -hmm. they'll start going in the crate if there's not a lot of other stimulus stimuli in the in the uh, weaning pen area. The most right. interesting, enticing thing is the crate. And now, it, when they go in there and they automatically start going into the crate with their chew project, now it's it's a short order of business to just then gradually start closing the door. And before you know it, voila. You have a puppy that loves its crate, loves yep. to relieve to go in there. So that's the difference. Okay, awesome. That was that was great. Um, so let's talk real quick about field trip sessions. So okay. one thing that a lot of breeders and puppy owners do are what we call field trip sessions, where they take the puppy to a new environment and let them watch things and listen. And maybe if the environment is safe, get out and explore a little bit. Um, and obviously a lot of people are not able to do that right now or have restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, uh, Camille and I jumped on here and we talked about where you, if you know, the law is allowing you to mm -hmm. going and driving somewhere and just sitting in your car mm -hmm. and rewarding them for watching and listening mm -hmm. at a safe distance. Right. Um, is there anything that you would recommend beyond, you know, kind of hanging out in, in the right. car? Well, a couple things. Um, I'm sorry, Sue. So what? Can you give me a break, Sue? So she, she knows. <laughs> she can't. She's got to. She's got to be part of this broadcast. There she is. <laughs> so, okay, a couple things. Very interesting. Um, first of all, I can I do. I'm lucky enough to have. Still, we had ordered a bunch of those Clorox wipes. We mm -hmm. have have a, a lot of storage in our basement. So we have plenty of Clorox wipes. So yeah. I take them with me everywhere. And um, my original idea was to just let Alana see people from a distance mm -hmm. and, you know, have her kind of take in things by osmosis. What's so interesting and, and is that she who never once ever had any problem with any person became mm -hmm. very alarmed by this procedure of me yeah. kind of walking up to people and stopping about 10 feet away and talking to them and yeah. she bark at them. And I realized that in her whole experience, I had always approached other people and mm -hmm. suddenly I was stopping and that was socially wrong to her. And, mm -hmm. you know, well, I mean, listen, I'm imputing, uh, you know, cognitive processes. I don't know, but it was alarming. I mean, we right. could say objectively speaking, she was alarmed by that. Right. So I said, well, this is really not helping. You know, it's just, even if I fed her, she still was very wary and she's not yeah. a wary puppy. So what I started doing is putting down, pulling out some wipes, putting them down, walking back, having the person wipe their hand, you know, sanitize, then I would just let go of Alana and have them call her to them. Mm -hmm. and she would go and they would just pat her, not kiss her, just right. pat her, and then I'll call her back. I mean, there's obviously a lot of re re prerequisites with this. She's already yeah. fairly socialized. She's leash trained. She has a recall, which yep. is very important. Um, so it, this has turned out to be a better procedure for us. Okay, interesting. Um, now, what, what's interesting is I wonder a very young puppy that had never experienced outside people yeah. might not be upset by people standing away. Yeah. Because they don't know that that's unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, dogs are just so amazing. Yeah. That they read our social cues 
when we don't even know that we're giving off social cues. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that distance to her was very alarming. Now, without a doubt, and this is a, you know, this is a thing that seeing things at a distance, and I mean like a further away right. across the street or coming down the, the trail or the street to you is very alarming to dogs. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, right? We've seen it. I've had puppy owners call me and say, "Well, I don't, I don't know." Or what? We were out on the trail, and all of a sudden, she was barking furiously at some guy who was running by. I'm like, "Were you alone?" Yes. Was there anyone else there? No. And, well, so some man is running toward you. I mean, yeah. yes. the dog great. Yeah, <laughs> be worried. So, um, you know, but this is a little bit of a. a an area that we just never explore because we don't do it. You don't walk up to somebody and have a conversation with them from 10 feet away. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, you know, things like that to be aware of. I, I'd be interested to hear uh, if there are breeders on, if they're doing this, if they're noticing some of the same thing, like with the puppies that had started to be socialized and then maybe whether they notice that if they're, you know, from the first get go right. doing it this way. It's a big social experiment, as I said, and it's, it's it interesting, yeah. So really just making sure that you're keeping an eye on your individual puppy. And if we're starting to see signs of stress or a change in behavior that's for the worse, then we kind of need to reevaluate what we're doing and change it up. Right. And specifically, you have to be prepared for it. And, you know, right. one thing is rubber gloves and or hand sanitizer so that people can in interact with your puppy. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in general, with all socializa socialization outings, we want to be as planned as possible so that what we can control, you know, we've thought of, obviously. Here's another thing that I didn't even think of, but now I do, is I bag up the treats into little uh, baggy, little like mm -hmm. brand baggies so that I can throw treats to person. another person and they can give treats to my puppy because yep. like, the first time this happened to me, I only had my big bag of treats and I'm like, well, now I won't be able to pick up, you know, I mean, it's, right. just, it's just a, you know, again, planning. Yeah. As much as you can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to talk real quick about um, some breeds who might be genetically predisposed to have certain behavioral traits. We okay. certainly, Know that there are some breeds of dogs who are more wary of strangers, some breeds of dogs who are more likely to be uh, uncomfortable with other dogs close by. Mm -hmm. um, are there any changes in the socialization process now um, where you could give some insight to, to things that they should maybe focus on? Uh, well, I mean, you're talking dog on dog or hu human aggression. I mean, they're, they they kind of don't sort together and they, they're, um, so, okay. The dogs that are going to be wary of strangers, mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt, I mean, I don't have any different advice. I mean, yeah. you just have to make more effort to get out. Like I yeah. have a 14 week old puppy in a breed that is very gregarious that has already had some socializing. So I'm not freaking out about this. If she were a cattle dog puppy, yeah, I'm freaking out. I mean, I, yeah. I don't, don't freak out. <laughs> You'd you know, be a little worried. Make it a priority. Let's say it that way. Make it a priority to make sure that she got out a lot and saw a lot of, a lot of dogs because I mean, they come by it honestly. I mean, they're, they're self-appointed, guardian of the stockman the stock and his property i mean that's their job they don't right. you know so uh, and it's it's actually you know the the really good news is that oh, sorry my my computer's barking at me for updates <laughs> the really good news is that it doesn't take a ton of exposures it just takes right. enough good ones right so when I say I make it a priority, I, I make it, you know, a daily priority. Not that the dog has to meet a thousand people. Right. One person, it's the novelty, right? It's that, it's that first and it's that ability to see it and get over it. Right. And one encounter a day is more than enough. I mean, so it's, it's very doable, even within social distancing, you know, yep. it's very doable. Um, now dog on dog is, is a little different. Um, because I, I, 
for young puppies, I definitely still think a puppy, you know, a pu when I say young puppies, under 12 weeks old, I still would like to try and get my puppy together with another puppy if possible. Now, again, you know, the people, one person is going to have to take charge of those two puppies and that person, you're going to have to trust that person. Right. That's what I would be doing if I had a puppy that age. Again, I was just lucky enough that my puppy already had that before this happened. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, after 12 weeks, you really, my focus with my dogs is to ignore other dogs. Right. And I do have a breed that doesn't, you know, is, is notorious for same sex aggression and, you know, not really being infinitely tolerant of other dogs. Mm -hmm. So uh, absolutely to me, I'm looking for non-reactivity. I'm looking for other dogs basically being a zero. Right. The other thing that my dogs are, I mean, paradoxically is frenetically interested in playing. So they, they really, really want to go play with everybody until they, you know, until things go wrong and then they want right. to mix it up. So, you know, <laughs> so my thing is with my dogs is ignore. I mean, okay. just, and, and uh, my program attention is the mother of all behaviors. I, yeah. I actually give a video of my cattle dog puppy, my last cattle dog puppy, showing coming into a busy dog show arena and just teaching her, look at me, ignore yeah. the dogs, look at me. Yeah. And doing it so that it's her idea, not mine. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not on cue, but something like that. And I think yeah. that there's a lot of programs like that now. I'm not trying to yeah. sell my program, but we do have a program for it. Yeah. So th that's what's going to be really important more so than getting those interactions. Yeah. So I don't think in terms of puppies over 14 weeks, so 12, 12 to 14, but 12, right. weeks, really, I don't think anything really changes. Yeah. I don't think anything really changes under, you know, you've got a little more complicated situation that you're going to have to deal with. Right. Might have to the law, to break the law. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to certainly be mindful of right. what their current restrictions are in their area. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you mentioned um, having a show dog and bringing your show dog into a busy area and working on attention. Mm -hmm. I know that that's a big concern for lots of people who are planning on having maybe a service dog in training mm -hmm. or a confirmation puppy mm -hmm. or a sports prospect. You know, we're kind of worried about not being able to be in those environments right now and, and get our puppy used to paying attention to us or relaxing in that environment. Mm -hmm. um, are yeah. there any recommendations or any training things that you recommend that people pick up, you know, maybe settle on a mat or continuing attention in whatever environments they have? Yeah. I mean, I think, listen, uh, the, the, again, it's an interesting social experiment because yeah. I think that done correctly, going to the venue and this like four to six month puppy thing that they have now with right. UKC and stuff can be tremendously beneficial. But, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you. I don't think most people really do it correctly. I think most people are, have been over facing their puppies a lot. Yeah. So it's really okay not to do that. Yeah. I, I, I do do it, but I'm expert and I am also always ready to pull chalks. If I see anything looking right. You know, if it's not a positive experience, yep. um, I don't know that most people, you know, I put it this way. I still would recommend it and do my best to help people do it the right way. But right. What I'm saying is I don't know how much of a huge loss it is for most people that they can't go do a dog show or go to their dog, you know, take their puppy to the dog yeah. court because. Because it can be really overwhelming for them at that age. Very overwhelming. And. So the core concept that I really, really always want mm -hmm. in my young puppies is that a new place is a cue for we're going to work together now. That right. We're now actively going to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you can absolutely do now and probably, again, you know, better because people can't be greedy trainers. <laughs> so. Right nobody's having any dog training now. So I imagine a lot of buildings are available for rent. Mm -hmm. So I would rent a space mm -hmm. and 
I have a saying, the first walks on me, the second walks on you. So I would bring the puppy in, let them explore the space. Yep. Then I take them out, put them in the back in the car, in the crate, 15 minutes, 15 minutes to a half an hour, take them out again. Now you're on duty. Okay, now you've had a chance to acclimate. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to wait and I'm going to start working attention. I'm going to yep. start working just this is what we do when we get in here. So again, this becomes um, an absolute um, um, routine mm -hmm. for us when we get to a new place. You it's come in, you're allowed to orient, you're allowed to sniff, you're allowed to do what you want. Then you go in the crate for a half an hour. 15 minutes to a half an hour, you come out, now you're on duty, let's go. Yeah. So, so again, just like distractions become cues for attention, yeah. novel venues become cues for working. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Better performance for my dogs at trials and dog shows than at home. Yeah. Yeah. And if you guys are truly stuck in home and are not allowed to be driving around, because I know there are lots of places right now where you're not even allowed to drive, mm -hmm. you know, a certain distance from your house, even just going and working out back, you know, on your back deck or in your front yard or in a different room in the house, you could still kind of mimic yeah. that same concept. Yeah. Of Don't explore. explore. Don't break the wall. Yes. Huh. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're still allowed to make essential trips. Okay. So there yeah. still are plenty of essential trips that you have to make that are dog friendly. Yep. So, you know, you can also use those trips. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're going with a significant other in the house, you know, they could go do the shopping that needed to be done and you could be there yeah. working. With Absolutely. The puppy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, so, so the, the, the bottom line being the core concept that mm -hmm. novel venues are cues for this is what we do we work yep because yep. You know, otherwise it's just this is what we do we either freak out or go wild i mean because they, they tend to over modulate whether it's over modulate toward the fear or over modulate toward uh you know pl play drive just for right. that want to get around and interact with everything so right. you know, this is it's a good test for them it's a good <laughs> skill yeah <laughs> And, and a good test for the people, because I certainly know lots of pet people that want to immediately just take their dog out everywhere with them. And now we're being encouraged or forced to be a little bit more strategic about what we are doing with our puppies. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so with the, um, I know in puppy culture that, that you guys work on, you know, turning on noises um, in the background mm -hmm. for desensitization or counter conditioning mm -hmm. because a lot of these environments that these dogs will be going into um, these sports dogs, these service dogs mm -hmm. are noisy. Do you recommend that people, if they're stuck at home, practice playing some of those noises? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, noise sound is a, an essential part of socialization. Interesting. Yep. And we use sound in a bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're describing is habituation and, mm -hmm. and, um, desensitization. Yeah. So, which is great, a great tool, but it kind of brings up another thing, which that people um, have a little bit of, well, how can I say? There's a lot of dog training jargon out there, right? Yeah. And people don't really understand, like, what does it mean to habituate the dog to something? What does it mean to keep the dog under threshold? And, you know, what, in a nutshell, what you have to be careful of with this is that you're not sensitizing the dog right. by pushing it too too fast. Like in yeah. other words, don't think you're gonna make up lost time by just playing that really loud and you know, while your dog is shaking, like you yeah. always have to be watching your dog mm -hmm. start it very, very low, almost yep. inaudible, and only very gradually over time raise the volume. And you should never really be getting a reaction out of your dog with this. Yep. So just having it loud on in the background, I, I don't recommend. Yep. I, I recommend doing it in a measured way because the damage that you could do by sensitizing is worse. Likewise, I mean, you know, mentally the the dogs need a break. So yep. and and sound actually can have a profound mental effect on dogs. That they did a study with shelter dogs and they found that dogs that listen to hard rock music versus classical music, mm -hmm. the hard rock, 
music dogs barked more, they had more neurotic behaviors, the, the classical music dogs slept more, were calmer, had fewer neurotic behaviors. So the, the bottom line is that these background sounds are discrete protocols that you have to take seriously and do correct time frame and then put them away. It's not just flooding the dog constantly with noise. The dog right. needs quiet times, literally where their ears can just rest. Mm -hmm. The dog can use some nice centering music sometimes mm -hmm. to settle down. You know, uh, even like sounds of nature, you know, relaxing things that just, so you need all different kinds of, of, of uh, habituation and also socialization to sound. Yep. Yeah. Including no sound at all. Including no sound at all. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. again, quiet time, we, you know, everything's off. We're going to sleep. Yeah. That's what we're doing. Yeah. So real quick, I want to talk about that quiet time because I, I worry as a trainer a little bit that with everybody staying home, mm -hmm. they won't be crating their puppies as much or allowing their puppies to have alone and independent mm -hmm. time. And obviously that can have a huge impact on their ability to be comfortable when left alone. Mm -hmm. um, so when you are at home with your dogs, and, and I know that you've got a young puppy that you're working with too, um, how do people or how do you recommend that people kind of find a balance between allowing the puppy to be with them and then still putting the puppy away either in an X pen or in a crate for true alone time? Right. Well, actually, this is exactly what we're going to be talking about in our next puppy class. Mm -hmm. which is, um, for your listeners, viewers, Madcap University, it's free. We are giving a COVID four week free online puppy training course for yeah. people that couldn't get into puppy class. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is actually what we're going to address next time, but I'm going to give you the summary. Okay. Which is that we always recommend that our puppy owners take two weeks off when they first yeah. get a puppy. And and this is this is one of those places, Chelsea, where I, all these years I never really realized what they were doing during those four weeks. So <laughs> this happened, and all these people are ready. And I'm afraid my puppy's going to have separation anxiety. They're going to be with me all the time for these two weeks, and then they're. Gonna, I was like, holy smoke! <laughs> you guys have been doing. I but I failed as a teacher. I never really realize that they wouldn't use the time to right. establish routine yeah. or yeah. protocols. And this is, you know, I'm not a big schedule person because I feel like that, that will come back to haunt you with dogs. Yeah. I mean, I had a friend that you could not call her anytime from four o'clock in the afternoon until those dogs got fed at five. I mean, literally, you just couldn't call her because those dogs were barking because they knew they got fed at five. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not big into doing the same exact thing at the same yeah. I like to make we need our dogs to adjust to new environments and new routines. everything. Right. You're traveling, your shows that they get yeah. but I do very much believe in these sort of touchstone um routines mm -hmm. that you know that are cues for oh, we're transitioning to this now. Right. Oh, you're in the kitchen removing dog dishes, we're gonna eat now. Oh, yeah you're sitting at your desk quietly, we're gonna sleep now. Yeah. Um, you have gotten up and walked into the living room. There, you know, it's like yeah. the door opening and shutting on all these. Yeah, absolutely. Pictures. So my short answer to you is that you should be spending this valuable, this invaluable time with your puppy crafting a day mm -hmm. that includes up and down time. Yeah. I, again, a pet peeve of mine is uh, puppy daycare, where they just leave the puppies out in a herd. Yep. All the, the the puppy just comes back overstimulated. I mean, the owner's happy because the puppy's so exhausted, hasn't been able to put its head down all day. It's not good. No. Um, the better puppy daycares, I mean, that's like one way that you can actually separate, you know, weed out the good ones from the bad ones, is the good right. ones are always going to include how they 
makes sleep and rest available to the public yeah. and how they structure it and go back and forth. Listen, a 10, eight to 10 week old puppy, just a rough rule of thumb, mm -hmm. be asleep for three hours every hour it's awake. So, the, so those three hours are, it's time to learn to be alone. And that's yeah. key. I mean, so I, like I said, that's a whole thing that we're going to go over like, and I'm going to talk about my day and how your day might have looked. Mm -hmm. This is one of your core tasks in those first two weeks is to establish yeah. that sort of routine. And that includes, you know, downtime. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a key piece that a lot of puppy people miss. You well, know, they don't, they, they think the puppy should just be out with them all day long and they should just keep tiring it out until finally it sleeps. But then we're creating really bad habits of over arousal and overstimulation. And then we're creating these puppies that don't have that off switch that's so essential for them to have when they're young for their health and development, but also then once they age into adult dogs. Absolutely. And well, doesn't it also tell you why we keep getting the questions about biting? Like, mm -hmm. how is it possible yeah. that puppies don't bite me? And yet everybody, well, and now I know. Yeah. It's been a big, it's been a great learning experience for us as instructors. Don't you think? I do. I do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And for our, and for our students. <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I, I think, you know, I think, I think that there's going to be some really good changes that come out of this to the way that we teach things and the way that we do things. I, you know, I, I listen, thank uh, God bless me and my family are okay. You know, yeah. um, and I, everybody has their own experience and, and I, I can only tell you how I feel. And I do feel like it's a, it, Overall, when when we all, you know, get through this, there's going to be a lot of positives that come out of it. Yeah, I think there will be too. I think there will be too. Um, well, Jane, before we head out here, um, are there any last pieces of information that we didn't talk about in terms of puppy socialization that you would like to share? No, I think that was it. I mean, I I, I think that um, I think we covered it right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. So if people want to find out more about you and some of the services that you are offering, how can they connect with you? Uh, well, the, okay, so MADCAP University, M-A-D-C-A-P University, is where the free online puppy course is. So there, there is a recording of the last one up now. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is actually buy the course. It's zero dollars. It's free, but you have to buy it and create an account, and then your you'll have your whole student dashboard set up. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say that it's not. Um, we launched this, and I'm again going to have to give a shout out to James, our developer in the UK, and my husband Mark. This was not really ready to launch until the end of the year, and they yeah. put it up in like three days and yeah. it's featured. It's not everything it's going to be, but it's actually pretty darn good. Yeah. <laughs> pretty good. And um, so it's free. It's there. And I, I, you know, I hope it helps some people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also just for anyone watching, we do have um, a Facebook group that we created. Um, it's about raising puppies during the pandemic. So we will link to that below. It's just a support group. There's some information in the units for them as well. Um, cause this can be a stressful time. So we just wanted everybody to feel like they had a place to talk and share. Um, oh, and then we, I, I forgot to say if they puppy culture, yep. culture.com. Sorry. I didn't mention it. No, I'm a <laughs> yep. <worst> field person. <laughs> You're fine. Um, and then we also have a YouTube channel with some free training videos that people can access. And we um, actually will be having a puppy online class as well. So if if anybody needs extra help, it is out there. We just got to band together and make it happen. Absolutely. Jane, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I think that was a lot of really helpful information for our people. So I really appreciate fun. it. I'm glad we could do it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope you have a lovely evening. Go Stay enjoy her. You're, yes, you too. Yep. You, you, you tired my old dog out. She's she's gone. <laughs> she's just <laughs> tired from listening about those darn puppies. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Another puppy, really? <laughs> Poor thing.
<laughs> well, thank you again for joining us. Have a lovely evening. Have fun. Nice Bye. meeting you. Bye.